All right, gentlemen, we're back. Welcome back to the Hammer Time Rackets podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Peter Cipriano. With me today are my co-hosts, Ben Costin and Ed Hyde. Say hello, gentlemen. Good evening, Seth. Evening, Seth. Good evening. Uh, today, we're also here with Tom Billings. Uh, he's the current Racket Singles World Champion and half of the top-rated challenger pair uh, right now for the uh, the doubles, uh, partners Richard Owen. Among many of Tom's accomplishments as a racket player, he has won 11 open and singles and doubles titles, uh, including the last four British Open singles uh, tournaments in a row, three-time British amateur doubles, two-time U.S. and British amateur singles, one-time Canadian amateur singles champ. And I should also mention that he's overcome some extremely devastating losses uh, in the semifinals of the 2017 British Open doubles, the semifinals of the U.S. Open doubles, the semifinals of the 2016 Manchester Gold Racket, and the 2015 Tuxedo Gold Racket Spittoon oh, nice. doubles. Uh, all of those losses happen to be to me, but we don't have to get into that. <laughs> um, we're very excited to kick this off. I'm pretty sure that this is the first ever rackets related podcast interview. Um, so I think rather than getting into the boring stuff about where you grew up and how you played and what you eat and all that nonsense, uh, we can be a bit more dynamic here and dive a little bit deeper into some real issues surrounding the game of rackets and what your thoughts are. So, okay. Um, well, thanks everyone for having me. Absolute Absolutely. pleasure to be on with you, great men. Absolute great. You're bringing a lot of excitement to the rack as well. I've been an avid listener, and I'm absolutely honored to be on here with you, chaps. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we've consulted, and we agreed the best way of doing this would do to be doing a short Q&A um, and sort of have a, a, a general discussion around a few of the, the questions. Um, so I'll start with several, you know, the first of several questions that we've prepared, and here we go. First question for you, Tom. Of the current crop of active singles rackets players, who do you reckon is the toughest competition out there and who do you think has the best chance of becoming the next world champion after you? Well, he's waving at me on the podcast. Um, I, think, uh, I think it'd be tough to overlook Benny C. Um, you know, obviously he's had a great couple of seasons. He's a fantastic player, but we won't say too many nice things about him because he's, he's right there. Um, but, but, but apart from that, I think, um, well, you know, it's equally hard if hard to, to look past Rich Owen uh, and, and Alex Duncan Vines, both of whom um, are brilliant players and could, could easily have a, have a good run to, to something like that. Um, yeah, any, any, any one of those three, I think. Can't say I don't disagree. Okay. Ben Costin, we'll put you at the top of the top of the list as the there you go. barely sneaking out a U.S. Open victory over Richard Owen in 2020. Well, you, um, I did not prepare that question. I personally <laughs> prepared that question. I think you have partially have Tom Billings to thank for your uh, U.S. Open win, having gone fairly deep, I think, with Rich in the semifinals, tiring him out a bit. Appreciate that one, Tom. Not sure that's the case, but anyway. Very good. All right, question number two. Tom, we did a bit of research in advance of this interview, and it was mentioned by anonymous source that you've specifically requested your Play Brave shorts to be extra short. Um, in hindsight, do you think that you may have been taking the name of the brand a little bit too literally when you made that request? Good question. Um, embarrassingly, I do know the length of my shorts. Um, they're six inches. They're pretty pretty tight. Um, they used to be eight inches. And when Play Brave released the six inch short, I was too excited. A um, bit like the Nadal circa 2008 French Open type thing. Um, they are they are a bit short. I I, I don't disagree. Um, but, uh, but yeah, big thanks for the shout out to Playbrave. Um, they do great things, love their kit, great whites, fit nicely, I think. They do hog the thighs. 
in a, in a very attractive in terms of the shorts they do they do hug the thighs I, i'd like yeah. to think that has something to do with the thighs but um potentially it's all short but who knows very good always good to give a plug to the to the sponsors there there you go um so i think heidi's plugging grays inadvertently with his gray nicks bat there that is quite nice i have to say are you wearing a gray's top as well at or what is that stone island what do we got uh, I've got Gray's, uh, I've got Gray Nichols tracksuit bottoms on. Um, but yeah, whilst we're here, big shout out to Gray's, uh, Richard Gray, Gray, all the Gray's family. Um, yeah, they do a cracking job. They certainly do. Run, runs in the summer, rollers in the winter, isn't it, Heidi? Absolutely. Gray's <laughs> motto. <laughs> Love that. Um, back to a, a real rackets question. Um, Tom, when I think of you and your game, um, the stuff that comes to mind, is, you know, are things like athleticism, speed, movement, grinding, hard worker, being fit, stuff like that. Um, I may have just given you the answer, but what do you think is like your single biggest strength as a player? Um, and that whatever you think that you're marginally better, like at a greater margin, better than, than the rest of the, the chasing pack, would you say? Um, good question. I, I, well, I, I think one thing I, I bring, a, I bring a big crowd that, that tends to help. I've got a big family, not many friends, but a big family. They tend to be a bit of a partisan crowd, which can help sometimes. Um, those things you mentioned, I think, uh, I'd like to think I've got some rackets, rackets ability in terms of, uh, I, I think I make quite a few errors, quite a few errors. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, fitness helps. I think, I think, unfortunately, those things you mentioned, sometimes you can, when, when, you know, when you know you can, can grind out matches and last a long time, sometimes when it's tight and you're nervous, you um, kind of rely on that, which, whilst that's no bad thing, I think my best games, the one I look, ones I look back most fondly is where I've actually been really aggressive and not necessarily relied on, on those things so whilst they are definitely strengths i think sometimes they can be in a way not a weakness but but something that i fall back on potentially when i shouldn't and could should keep and that's what i try and be i i what i keep telling myself is trying to keep being aggressive um so so yeah i mean if i could i think yeah, m movement and being in the right position more often than not is the most important thing in rackets. The hardest thing is hitting a ball, traveling as quick as it does when you're, when you're in the wrong position. So um, I'd like to think my movement, you know, getting in the right position more often than not is my biggest strength. Yeah, I would say as someone who's played and practiced with you a fair bit, you know, as much as I guess could be expected being across the pond, um, especially most recently when you came to New York to visit prior to the, um, to the challenge was your movement off the ball after you've hit to get back in a position where it's very difficult to get a ball past you or lay it down against you. Um, you know, you're, I think you and Will Hopton and actually Ben to some extent as well are three of the toughest guys when it comes to trying to find space on the court, especially towards the back of the court. Um, to, to keep the ball down and, and keep you guys from making ridiculous guts. So it was something that I think for me, like you, I noticed an improvement on and made you, I think like that much better and, and take a, a little bit of a jump. Um, that was something that stuck okay. out to me. Um, I, I think that's probably something to do with, um, I mean, the court's so big and the ball moves so quickly. It, it's, it's so much so important to be in a right, the right position when your opponent's hitting the ball. I, I mean, Ben does it does it brilliantly. Probably helps that we're quite small, right, Ben? We can just, you know. <laughs> um, I'd like to add that Tom kind of he's downplayed his kind of racket handling ability, and like a lot of people kind of downplay it because they don't really think it's one of Tom's like strengths. But when you see him in practice, he he can do anything that all these kind of flary guys can do as well. He's just more discipline than a lot to actually not hit behind the back shot and, you know, take balls over his head that, you know, some people do. So I, I think that's a strength that's a bit downplayed. Oh, that's nice you to say. 
I would give that to him. The other thing I think that we pointed out on one of the last pods was the fact that you've been able to change from a two-handed backhand on many, many shots to a one-handed backhand. And I think that's given you the ability to kill the ball off the back wall a heck of a lot more consistently and, and better um, and hit better length as well and have a better return too. So I think that that has been a big improvement over the last, I'd say like five, six years or something like that um, from when I Can first I saw you play. Just whilst we're on, we, I know Sips just alluded to Tom's, um, we're talking about the racket sort of ability and things like that, but we were just discussing Tom's sort of physical condition and court coverage. And I guess a question that might be uh, might be on the mind of an aspiring like rackets world champion, a youngster, or someone at school is like, what kind of things would you, what kind of things do you do off court? Um, is it like, is it endurance stuff? Is it, is it quick fire sort of shuttle? Um, yeah. Good question, Heidi. Um, I think you've got to, I, I do a lot of, I have to admit, I, I off court, you've got to enjoy it for a start, which I think I'm quite lucky. I quite like training. Um, and because of that, I think I, I mix it up. I do, I, my endurance stuff tends to be running. I like, I, I just, I just enjoy running. I'm one of those weird people um, that enjoy running. So uh, endurance wise and to help my kind of like overall stamina, it tends to be mainly running. Uh, albeit I was one of those COVID cyclists that loved cycling during COVID, which um, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. You hate to see it. Yeah. Team Sky and all that. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then it, yeah, speed, speed work and kind of interval work you know, you've got to enjoy being on the bike, doing intervals, rowing, that type of thing. Um, and, 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 and for speed, I think it's so important to have, we're going back to the tight shorts, but to have strong legs. Um, racket is a brutal game, as you all know. Um, it, it can punish your body. And if you're running into a corner quickly and having to stop, you know, having, having core strength and, and, and strong legs um, is, is really important. So, you know, anything you can do weights wise and stuff to, to help with that. I think you're, you're on, you're onto something. Um, I, I seem to remember actually when we used to play, when you were at Tunbridge, you were really into that type of thing. So um, you obviously know all this Heidi. So, you know, know that stuff. when you went to Chicago and found the ice cream cup. Yeah. I was about the to cookie say, jar. The cookie <laughs> jar. Oh. Uh, there is um, actually putting it into practice and doing it. Um, but yeah, I just find it quite an interesting quite an interesting topic to discuss and you see the way sort of real tennis has gone uh, you know that's become a lot more professional and the guys at the top there take have taken it increasingly seriously um regarding regimes and what they eat and and things like that um it's interesting to think about that the yeah. racket's whether whether that will happen in the next 10 years we'll see you know the top 20 all being very strict on what they eat and drink and what time they go to bed <laughs> yeah i mean i think i think Go on, go on, Benny. You go. I was, I was just going to say, if anyone wants to look closer, just go on uh, Play Brave's Instagram story. <laughs> I was going to say, refer to Play Brave. It gives you all the answers. R hill runs, rowing, yeah. Yeah. doing all this in one day. I mean, Tom, you did enough enough exercise in one day, and as I was doing a week. <laughs> I, I, yeah, go but... enjoy it. And actually, probably that more exercise in one day that many pro rackets players have ever done off court. So kudos to you. Well, for that. I know. I, I think that having having seen pretty quickly when I left school how fit like people like ATB and Hoppy were. If you wanted to hang with those guys, you had to had to do it. I think. Um, yeah, good. I think I think um, they're pretty impressive. I mean, you look at how fit people like. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm any fitter than the likes of Dunners and, and Ben and all these guys. Um, yeah, they're all very, very fit and strong. He's shaking his head, but there we go. Get you more aerodynamic. That plus the shorts <laughs> is a, de a deadly combination. Well, this is the plan with the lid, lid cut, aerodynamic. Very good. All right, on to the next question. Tom, you actually mentioned um, as one of your strengths having a large crowd. So I guess a follow-up question to that statement would, would be, who exactly are you looking up to in the crowd during matches when you're complaining? Because you're, you're very well known. I know. The coaches, uh, yeah. 
Can you explain yeah, what's yeah. going on there? Um, I, and I, if it's a tactic, what's, what's the deal with that? Well, firstly, I hate it. I hate that I do that. It's, I, I like, every time I finish a match, I'm always incredibly annoyed with myself for, 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 for doing exactly as you say. Um, I'd like to think, I mean, Heidi will know this. When you get out of cricket, the more that you can like put on a show that like <laughs> I shouldn't have got out kind of thing. Like I never make those mistakes, you, you know, like letting, letting everyone on the ground know that really you're a top cricketer kind of thing. With rackets, there's maybe something similar going on, which is like, did I really just make that error? Like I never make these errors and just making sure you let everyone know that I never make these errors. Um, Sounds like it's a much as much of a mind game for yourself as it yeah, is for, yeah. for the opponent and the crowd. Yeah, probably, yeah. Um, but who am I doing it to? I don't really know, to be honest. I mean, I'd probably do it if the crowd was empty. Yeah, um, I was going to say, I, I've marked a match that Tom played in the British Open or something. The gallery was empty and he looked up maybe twice. And I, I was <laughs> behind me to see if anyone was there. But <laughs> So I've got the question, really. Yeah. Looking up at yeah, the yeah. ghost of uh, Charles Williams or something. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right. Um, back to more serious rackets related questions. Um, Tom, what is your favorite court to play on? And do you believe that whatever that court is, is objectively the best court to play on in the world? Well, I really enjoyed your guys chat over the last couple of pods about this i feel like i learned a lot about the courts that i have pl actually played which was nice. um actually ben gave a great shout out to halebury which doesn't often get it um i, th I think that maybe because halebury isn't traditionally a you know a big or big big school for rackets or um a lot of the top players didn't necessarily play there when they were at school i don't know whether you guys think similarly but um it seems to have gone a bit under the radar but Halebury is a is a great court um obviously where I learned to play so I think it's great it's it's, it's pretty slow but it's it's very very bouncy very true um very high back wall um which is nice at times um I, I think it does suit me um to be honest I think over the years having played at Queen's so much I probably would take a game at Queen's over anywhere at the moment um but you can't be playing games at the the big courts like like new york and queens where there's huge galleries and lots of people and everything that that it comes with to be honest um i don't know what you guys think heidi would you play at yours at old court tunbridge best court in the world yeah well i'm really biased black. i think tunbridge black is that what they call it tunbridge black well the official name yeah. is the memorial court there's the plaque okay. there by cycling bins as you walk into the grand entrance. Um, but yeah, Tunbridge, Tunbridge Black or or Philadelphia, I think. Good okay, one. I've seen I've seen Sip have some big wins at. Uh, he's beaten me as well at fit at um, Detroit, so I think I know where his is. Yeah, I like a I like a uh, a very dead court. It's good for serving. I think the match where we played there in the doubles. I think I must have. I got hot on the backhand serve there and the ball was just kept not, pacing me. Not just kept pacing me. Is that weird? Yeah. I had more aces in that match probably than I ever have combined in any other <laughs> match ever. So I have, I have quite a good story about Hay playing a match at Haybury. When I, when I first learned to play rackets, um, I was probably about 12 and I'd never played a game. I never learned how to return serve or anything like that. And uh, the, our, our pro, Mike Cordron, uh, who's an absolute legend, just one day absolutely obliterated me. Like just hit 15, 15 aces in a row. Uh, and I was like, what, what, what the hell was the point of that? Um, he shook my hand and was like, I can, I'm going to remind you of this forever. Uh, and almost every time I have a big win, he just lets me know, well, I've bageled you. So it's absolutely fine. Um, he's never, never let me forget about it. <laughs> you know what? Well, start so somewhere. So, sorry? He mentioned it to me as well when I was at Wellington. He said, he just said, I bageled Tom Billington. I didn't even touch the ball. I, I'm not sure I got a serve back. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, a 12 year old Tom Billings, I would say you'd probably have a hard time holding up the racket even. 
Yeah, that's probably true, to be fair. Probably true. Um, <laughs> let's see. Moving on. I guess to follow up that question, what is your least favorite court to play on? We don't, no one get offended here if he picks your club, but uh, I'm sure this could be a little bit controversial. But if you had to pick a court not to play on in the big match, where would that be? Well, I've had some, I'm not sure I've ever won a game at Clifton. And I don't know why. I don't know why that is. I, I can't remember. I can't remember it. I couldn't describe it to you, but I remember it was a real bogey place for me to play. Um, I think so. That's from a school point of view. I think outside of school, like where we play now, um, that's a, it's a really tough one. I mean, not that, not that I not that I don't like it. I just would be a bit nervous playing any any big server on Cumber on um sorry on uh, Chicago too. Um, that's fair. Tough, tough. Actually, maybe now I'm looking at Heidi, I, I would say that a, a, another tricky place to play is, is the Tunbridge New Court. So if, you, you, if I wanted to describe it to you, you, you need, there's nothing wrong with it. They fix the front wall, you know, it's fine, it's quick. But the floor, you need, you can see your reflection. You, 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 you almost need sunglasses. It's that bright and shiny, um, which is a That's bit tough. Dis disconcerting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, um, it's like an eye strength because Makey never cleans it. <laughs> I wouldn't want to say that. It was, it was squeaky clean when I was there. <laughs> Obviously. So where's, just... where's your least favourite? For me? Yeah. For a long time, it was Philadelphia because I couldn't hit a serve there because I threw the ball about two inches in front of my face and then trying tr try to like rip down on it and the ball would foul cut out of court. And I had the same problem in Chicago. Um, I had a hard time in... Uh, in Montreal, I have to say, like it just didn't, did, I couldn't read the ball off the back wall, had a really hard time returning serve, had a hard time serving. Um, it was pretty cold too, so I was freezing my ass off. Um, so it was a great club and obviously like a great culture and atmosphere, but I just struggled with the court pretty badly. I'd say mine would have to be uh don't want to say this because I worked there last year, but Wellington, I struggle a lot on that court. Um, saying that, I've had like some of the best matches of my life as a schoolboy, always against Lewis Simmons and someone there, and it always went to five. But like recently, I just after a year, I still can stop foul cutting the serve there, so that was a bit annoying. But it's actually it's a great court. I just can really figure it out. Yeah seems like a lot of these cases it, it, it's more the player than the court and I, I would say that that's that certainly the case for the courts that uh that I struggle on and, and don't like as much moving on is it true Tom that you watch Harry Potter on every single plane ride across the Atlantic Ocean I'm a big Harry Potter fan but I I'm, I, I can't say that I watch it every time um but it but it does it is quite soothing isn't it so um I've probably watched it a couple of times for, for sure uh, on, on the, on the, on the route over. Um, could, be, could be worth trying the Lord of the Rings out, the trilogy, there, something like that. There, there was, there was a time back in the day when uh, Dick Ryan used to find it really enjoyable to route me via like some really just, he, he just enjoyed routing me via somewhere. So he put me via Dublin and wanted to see a, you know, kind of Guinness. Um, so my journeys across the to the states have always been quite exciting. Um, yeah, you never know where you might end up on the way. I guess, right? Do, do any of you have a, a a flight routine over to a tournament? Usually, just take a lot of sleeping pills. <laughs> <laughs> um, I must say, my flight over this year, I sat next to Duncliffe, and he just wouldn't stop talking about his training <laughs> programs or something. Um, but it kept me entertained. Well, what a legend. On the way there, on the way back, I, I, I must say, I think I watched Harry Potter. Yeah, love it. Love it. It's just a great, it's a very calming movie. I mean, I don't know what it has to do with rackets, but very, gets your, maybe gets you in the right headspace. Speaking of being in the right headspace, what do you think was your best and or most satisfying win in your career, Tom? 
Um, I mean, most satisfying, you know, you can't, the World Championship was something I aimed for, for for many years. So whilst, you know, it probably wasn't the spectacle necessarily that Dunn and I would have, we were pretty tight. Um, it was definitely the most satisfying in terms of the best wins, in terms of matches that stick out where I played the best. Um, I played an invitational final against Rich where I played, I don't, can't remember what year that would have been, 2015 or 16 maybe, um, where I was very, very happy with, with that. Um, I had a, an invitational final against Hopcroft, which, which went pretty well. Um, and actually, to be honest, I'm sorry to sorry to sorry to talk talk about the old boy while he's on here, but I was pretty pretty happy with how the British Open went last year. Um, I uh, I went into it without many expectations. I had, without wanting to make excuses, I had a little bit of blister trouble, um, which meant I had to come out pretty aggressively, which is tough when you're playing someone who gets the ball back as much as as much as Ben does. Um, and I managed to sneak it, which was which was um, which was very nice of him. Um, I'm sure he won't do that again. But uh, yeah, so I think those those few stick out the most, um, singles singles wise, anyway. I believe the 2016 Invitational might have been versus Rich because I'm pretty sure 2015 I've watched on YouTube, and I think you right. watched that in four, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Maybe that was, check yeah. the commentary. I remember it well. I'm the right. YouTube histo- resident U- YouTube historian. Who did I lose to? Rich. And four. Okay. okay. I, I'd say my favourite match I watch I watched um is with Tom involved is the British Open doubles. Must have been twenty sixteen against Snell and Mo. You won oh, yeah. That's, that's an absolute epic. Uh, with one of the best points you'll ever see. The end of one of the games. Yeah, four three. That was a long game. That was a long game. I thought you were going to say the British Open where Sip and Sip and Stouty took took us down, but that would have been we've laboured on that too much, have we? Yeah, we don't want to go into that too much. It was more <laughs> more stout than me. I was just there, especially at the end. That's it. Yeah, I was I was existing. That was about it. Um, I guess in that same vein, we won't we won't have to dwell on the answer to this question. But what would you consider your worst or most devastating loss? Um, good question. I had a few. Feel, feel, feel free to offend anyone. We don't, you know. Yeah, no, no. I, I had a few when I, I mean, obviously, I had a few, I had a few ones which I was pretty annoyed with myself with um, back in the day. Um, worst loss. I don't, I don't, I don't actually mind losing, to be honest. I haven't got, there's none that stick out. I mean, I was very disappointed that I didn't do myself a bit more justice in the game, in the doubles match against Jonathan and James in the doubles last two years ago. I can't remember when it was. Um, just just didn't, um, without wanting to speak on Rich's behalf either, both of us just didn't, didn't necessarily bring it. But credit to the both of them for, I mean, they didn't allow us to do much. So I think that was probably as, as upset as I've been after a game being something that Rich and I had worked to obviously such a good friend and put in so many hours of practice for that match um, to, to lose it in the manner we did was probably the most upset I've been on a, on a rack court. Um, I have to admit. Yeah. I think with that, having been there and having practice with you guys before that match on a couple mm-hmm. of, I think with Bailey and, and Hoppy and maybe coin as well. I think you guys are playing excellently well leading into the match, but going into that court, you know, their home court um, against those two guys who I think, you know, they both played exceptionally well. It's tough. It's really tough. Um, and there, you know, it's, it was just one of those things where I think, couple of things go one way or another at the beginning of a game and like the whole tide can turn in a doubles match. Um, yeah. I think, I think the, the, what, 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 what I remember of that match is how long it never feeling settled, which in a best of seven is pretty, pretty impressive to do. You know, like they, they, they came out obviously playing brilliantly like they always do. And you kind of expect at some point to settle, you know, you, you, you lose the first or so be it, you know, but you hope to get a bit of, a bit of a hold and, and a bit of confidence and, and just 
it just flew by. Um, I think that, yeah, that, that now you, now I've had the chance to think that is definitely, um, yeah, not, not, not because we lost, you know, necessarily, but just, just, it would have been nice for it to be a closer game. Um, we like that answer. That's a good answer. Fair answer. Okay. Maybe you'll get another shot at the end of the year. You never know. Oh, there you go. Let's, let's hope we can. Yeah. Um, one serve or two serves, which do you prefer? I'm, I've, had some, I've had some pretty brutal faults at key times. Um, Famous faults. <laughs> some pretty, pretty, pretty big. Well, not just one. It's a sad that it's a plural there, isn't it? Um, but I don't mind the one serve, even though I'm not necessarily that good at it. Um, I quite like it because you always feel you're in the game a little bit more returning, which I think is a good thing for rackets. So. Um, I don't really mind, to be honest. I, I quite like the quirk of it being different, um, you know, across the Atlantic. Um, do I want it all to turn to one? I don't, I don't, don't really mind. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Um, I quite like two serves purely because it's, I think rackets is the only game where you can take a fault, which is just something quirky, which I quite like. We've got that. No one else That's a fantastic point there, Ben. That is interesting. That's my biggest kind of thing for two serves, if I had to argue. But I, I, li I like the fact as well where it's two over here and one, one over there. I, I think mean, that's, again, I don't mind that. Um, what do you think, Ed? Um, well, I've been bought, brought up on a sort of, but on Dave Makey's instructions to get in the box. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm more of a uh, two serve all way can really nail the first first serve. It may fly out into the gallery at the back of the court, but as long as you've given it a good good wallop, it's fine. Uh, but that, yeah, having an insurance serve is is quite nice. I think if you can go aggressive on the first one. Yeah, I mean it makes for an interesting game. Having you know picked up the game later on in life and knowing other sports like having played squash and you know you get one serve. Obviously, it's not very hard to get a serve in there, but I have to say, like, I think it's a skill to be able to serve a good serve consistently rather than like a super aggressive, like while also being slightly aggressive, but not just absolutely hammering it um, that I think is underappreciated. Um, I personally prefer the two serve just because you can go after it. But I think I think that the game is better when it's one serve because you, you tend to get more re like returns back, I think generally um and it you know just i think it makes for better spectacle but again prefer to so you know take take that answer with a grain of salt um the next question was about your hair products but obviously that's changed given the fact that you don't have any hair left so we're going to move on to the uh the next question another cosmetic uh related issue in the 2018 U.S. Open in Philadelphia, you were famously smashed in the mouth uh, by your future world championship opponent, Alex Dunkler Vines. Shout out to ADV. Uh, were your dental costs from getting hit in the face and fully covered by the NHS? Oh, I mean, well, firstly, Dan, is, I feel, I felt, I still feel so sorry for him because having, having also hit someone on a racket score, it is the worst feeling in the world um and i i do feel still feel sorry for him he's, he's such a good guy and i know how bad he felt um although he still calls me chucky or something something about i mean i, I don't know he's it's unfortunately stuck you know knowing done as he doesn't forget it um but yeah so i was pretty lucky i actually remember when when uh when it happened talking about dental costs i was pretty delirious as you can imagine and i remember in the changing room just before I went over to the dentist, Hoppy being like, bring your card. And me just sheer panic, knowing that I just definitely did not have enough money on my card <laughs> to pay for whatever bill was coming. Um, so I went in my whites with my like debit card in my, in my white short, probably eight inch at that point. Um, and, uh, and yeah, but for, fortunately, you know, the, guys in Philly were just unbelievable. So, so kind, so generous, fixed me up. Um, 
yeah, it was it was very lucky. There, there was a funny story where I obviously had a bit of blood on my whites, um, and the lift opened as we were going up to the dental practice, and this lady was about to get in, saw this like bloke with blood all over him, and just just decided to give it a big leave and just um, you 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 go. <laughs> white as a sheet you know um but yeah no for, fortunately not covered by the nhs um my insurance is now dangerously high in the uk um but uh but because of the kind philly members that that didn't break the bank too much um, that's good to hear that those guys took care of you they were unbelievable i so so lucky to have had them very very kind very very kind yeah very good uh, Don't get him with on. the back or, or racket, chaps. Not, 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 not worth it. Drinking soup for months after was not much fun at all. <laughs> so two years ago or so, you had petitioned the TNRA, Tom, to recognize you. I think it was a semi-professional, um, but they basically knocked you back. Yeah. What are your thoughts on um, the status of basically all the non-club professional players being classified as amateurs and do you think that the you know the tnra or the powers that be should reconsider those classifications in the future See, this is a good question um, it's a very controversial it's, it's question, question and we yeah we don't question. care how long do you have how long do you have united are playing tonight Sip, so we need to yeah. wrap this up don't we they just started um, i gotta actually check that score while you're uh, talking um yeah look i i when I was playing, I'm sure it was the same for, for you guys, um, slightly different for you, Sip, but to watch the, when you're a schoolboy watching the like adults play, I was lucky enough to watch Guy Smith Bingham play one of his like eliminators at Haleybury. It, it completely inspired me to play the game and keep playing because of watching, you know, when you're a kid, it's hard to have long rallies. It's such a difficult game, but seeing it played at the top level was just, unbelievable you know it was so different to anything i'd seen um you know it kept me playing and and what my proposal to the tnra <laughs> was to try and you know I, I i'm lucky i have time um was to try and encourage you know a group of us um at the time you know that obviously we've now got ben as a top pro um but some of the top amateurs who at the time were the you know the best players in the world to go and play at the schools um, to coach, to help out, to show them what it was like to, you know, just, just be an add on to the pros that are already there. I mean, I, I'm saying with all these schools, they all have kind of pro budgets to bring in, you know, experts in their fields, like at hockey and cricket, we'd, we'd always have, you know, pros come in and do a session once a month or something um, to like supplement you know, what we were learning um, and to probably help our, our own school coaches just see something different and, you know, um, uh, you know, and, and, and something like that. And I just thought having that that could work at something like with, with rackets. Um, it's obviously really important that we support the pros. They are the lifeblood of our game, but I see, I saw the proposal as actually helping, um, keeping more people in the game, help, you know, fresh ideas, assisting them when they when they need it um and I, yeah I, I was really keen to try and not not just to play more rackets but to try and you know give back to I, I was lucky enough to play with hoppy when i was at school um slightly di different circumstances he came as an assistant pro i'm sure ben is inspiring the next gen as well but some of the schools don't have access to that um it was just a way of trying to do that. As you say, it was shot down uh, pretty swiftly. Um, but I, I, yeah, I still think it was a, it's, a, it's a nice idea. Um, who knows? What do you guys think? I think the good thing is that here we have, you three all love the game. I'm sure you'd, you know, giving something back is really important, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I was lucky enough to, um, when I was at school at Sunbridge, um, Tom used to come in uh, to school quite a lot um, and play with the boys. Um, you know, you know, two or three hours a week. That just opens your eyes to, to sort of the, the sport after school. Um, you know what you you know what it's like. Thing you know 
seen the top player come and play with you on a sort of weekly basis. Um, it was good fun, and you picked up things from, from watching Tom, and he used to give you tips. Um, yeah, it just made you want to buy. It made you want to buy into the game and carry on playing. Um, so there's that side to it as well. It's not just sort of the tactical um, advice that you might get from some some of the top players like like you guys, but it's also you know incentivizes you to carry on and support the game when you leave school. So I think I think what Tom's just talked about there, that idea is a great one, and it works in other sports. Um, it may just require a bit more time for sort of the pros to, to sort of soften up and uh, towards it. I think it's a good idea. Over to you, Ben. I can say having been in these pros meetings, um, like well, I don't think there was that much against it, to be honest. Oh. I mean, they were all pretty, pretty boring. I think it was just a sort of breakdown between the sort of TNI and the pros and then back to, back to you, really. I thought they felt that was quite a good idea. Just sort of went on, on to like tournaments and prize money and things like that, which got a bit more controversial, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a great idea, personally. I mean, I remember at school just um, obviously watching like um, all the top players, but also Christian used to come in and like bagel me three times in about 10 minutes and that's not not enjoyable but kind of opened my eyes up having been like one of the top school boys kind of realised like how how rackets can be played um, so I, I think it's a good idea to get as many sort of top players around the place as possible maybe not you know failing everyone pretty consistently <laughs> but yeah have you ever have you ever double bageled someone in a, you know played someone in a tournament and they haven't won a point um, Has anyone? I, I, don't think I think I did one time, yeah, in the gold rackets at least once. <laughs> you horrible person. My closest was um, quite this. This is my favourite. Was I did a one in love against um Hector Hardman when we were very young, and then he beat me in the Foster Cup semi final. <laughs> but That's a pretty good comeback from Mr. Hardman. Shout yeah, out. So, um, that that's my favourite one. Looking back, because I can say I was confident. I was definitely better than him at one stage before he got better than me. Interesting. I would say for myself, the uh, the semi pro pro thing. I mean, I mine is probably a controversial opinion um, and probably not very popular with a lot of people. But I think to call you Tom and am like a pure amateur in rackets is a ridiculous statement. Um, and I'm a capitalist as well. So I think if you want to declare to be a professional and accept money that you should be, I mean, like, so I think classifying you or at, you know, formerly Alex Titchener Barrett or before him, John Pren or whatever, as amateurs, you know, they're not accepting money and you're not accepting money, but you're training as professionals and you're having people pay for you or, or you know, someone's sponsoring you guys or you're sponsoring yourselves or whatever. Um, but someone who's going to a club and training for, you know, an hour, two, three hours a day, whatever, I think it's just a, it's sort of a, a joke to be calling that person a, a true amateur. Um, and, you know, maybe it'll bring more money into the sport and help the sport grow. So I think, you know, a lot of people want to keep the sport small, small and keep it an amateur game. And that's perfectly fine because they like it that way. Um, but I would, I would always think that, such a great game um it's very small in the community but um you know if it didn't get to me i would never have gotten the chance to have so many great experiences and i think that a lot of people you know should have we should give as many people as many opportunities to to learn the game and play the game as possible and if that means you know opening it up and bringing more money into the game i'm all for it next question what are your thoughts on the current separate ranking systems of the TNRA um, and the associated challenge procedures? So for the, for the world championship procedures, and do you think that the system should be combined into one system or do you think that the separation is better? Hang on. So this is, let me just, this is a two part sort of, this is a tough question. question. I, think, yeah. I think Okay. about the difference between the Neptune and the elite. Is that, is that what we're talking about? Yes, but then also the, the challenge procedures, I guess, associated to that. So, for example, you know, you've got 
Will Hopton, I think, would be in one ranked, maybe number three or four, but in the other ranked, like, eight, because he hasn't played enough tournaments or whatever. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, it's all a bit confusing, isn't it? I mean, the fact that we have to ask the question of what we're talking about makes it probably is exactly <laughs> Probably is exactly the issue, isn't it? Um, I, I don't really know. I mean, the, the World Championship challenge points and the elite world rankings, I suppose, I suppose do do a job, but um, it's such a small pool of people that people still look at the Neptune rankings system, which you know isn't necessarily up to date or, or whatever, and there's just so many different moving parts. I think, I think probably just a combination. I, I understand why there needs to be a difference between the Neptune one, which was done on games, and like a, a new um, World Championship Challenge points come elite ranking system. But maybe just do it as one. You know, do that elite as, as one. Um, I, I don't know. I haven't really... I'm not entirely sure. It is a bit confusing. That's probably the issue. I don't know. What do you think, Ben? Um, I... I, I think the um the elite single is kind of it's pretty accurate at the top like it's not it's not too bad and it kind of rewards people for playing things. I think it kind of just about gets away with it in the singles and then in the doubles it's like because it every, well the way it works you need a certain amount of players in the top ten so you need a certain amount of pairs to put points into the system. There's there's not many pairs in the in the top ten really. There's, there's only sort of six that have any points. Um, so like um, I mean I remember a couple of years ago Dunkless and me won Manchester we got one ranking point or something from it which like doesn't, doesn't really mean too much um, and in the singles you got the Invitational which gives a lot of points um, because there's so many top 10 players and in the doubles you don't have that as well so like, there's just not many points going into it so it's a bit skewed to me I think I think for me, one of the changes that I didn't necessarily agree with, but I do understand the reasons as to why it was done, is I believe they changed the rankings to be your best two tournaments in a ranking period, rather than, or, or, or you know, rather than, because I think, unfortunately, what that does is it means people play in two events, um, or, or, you know, you can get away with playing less events, um, which I understand the reasoning as to why, Um but surely we want to encourage people to play as much as possible and as often as possible to get the biggest draws, the best draws, um, and, 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 you know, limiting it to be the better of, um, or, or, you know, um, both as a, as a world challenge procedures and a ranking thing, I think it's just a bit of a shame because it's, it's moving still further from a professional sport. You know, we're, we're, we're not encouraging people to, to play frequently and therefore getting the best players playing. It's a very good point. Heidi, anything to add with your... Uh... Heidi, what's it like on the Neptune? Talk, talk me through it. Oh, it's, it's v what, what are some of the big, what are some of the big changes recently? Talk, I, I want to hear about Ed Hyde's last couple of years, you know, big game wins, etc. cetera. Been... <laughs> been very bleak the past couple of years um erosion hit me hard um, to the extent i actually think i'm below dave making the rank you are uh, I, I put in all the neptune rankings um so i know exactly where you are heidi uh, um, well, yeah so it's um i don't like to talk about it to be honest okay Top 50, mate. You're, you're slowly uh just it's a sensitive subject and i think that there was a meme made at one point uh in the rackets the tennis and rackets memes page about Hyde's ranking. Um, it may have been my first contribution to the page, but we don't have to discuss that right now. Uh, next question. Okay. Um, who, and I'm actually interested to hear Ben and Ed's answer to this question as well. Who, and Tom actually suggested this question in the lead up. Who do you think are the most underrated players slash scariest early round match? early round matches that you could be looking at for like an open or an amateur or something like that. Give me three. You go first. You two go first. I've thought about this answer. So you two go first. I've got one singles and one doubles answer. Go ahead. 
I've got a singles answer of Tony Morales because I played him in the British Open and he nearly beat me um, first round. That, that was not fun. My doubles answer is a really rogue shout and I mentioned it to Heidi before about the Noel Greece. Um, it was Mombio and Buckley who um, always do well in the Noel Greece, always get one round further than they should. Um, I've marked them in the amateur and they were one game up of Cockcroft and Duncliffe lines. Um, or wow. it, was, it was in the set at least. Um, I mean, they got to the first pair final, I think, or maybe not them, but Buckley played a lot of rackets at school, which was very good. Um, so I, I just think they're very underrated as a pair, considering most people wouldn't have heard of them. Um, but they always do well in the Nulbury and the amateur doubles performance. Uh, did I need one more? I, I don't know who that would be. I would, I would have said Mike Bailey in singles about two years ago, but he was sort of, people didn't always said Mike's good at doubles, but not very good at singles. Um, and I played, I played him in the British Open, the one where it was my first time I got to the final when you beat me full up. And I played him in the first round, I think, or might have been the quarters, and he, he was 2 1 up on me and 12 10 up or something. And he was unseeded that year, so I would have said him. So he's very good now, and top five for sure. That's it. Hi, um, Shields. Yeah. I think uh, left-handers give me the creeps. Um, so I think uh, you'd have to go with someone. <laughs> you'd have to go with someone like Tommy Shields. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't know what what version of Tommy's going to turn up. He could come on court and absolutely smoke you in fifteen minutes, or it could just be fireworks and you know rackets are being broken, the balls are flying into the galleries. So that's the one I if I if I saw myself drawn against him, um, I'd be a bit scared. I think coming from my perspective as sort of like standard sort of club player, I'd be scared of drawing like a Steven one of the Stevens brothers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because when they're hot, they're really hot. Um and yeah, it could just sort of um sweep you aside pretty quickly. So I think yeah, uh Tommy and then the two Stevens brothers for me. On the doubles front, Ben's Ben's already uh alluded to it, the the in the Noel Bruce Radley five or Radley four. Um fourth Ed Monbier and George Buckley somehow always seem to do better than all the other rabbits. Um, and I, I actually played with Tommy Shields and an old Bruce about three years ago. Uh, uh, we were in a group with them and I thought, yeah, this should be all right. Me and Tommy should, uh, should get through this nice and easily. Um, and we lost within about 20 minutes to love. And then they did pretty well in the main draw uh, for a non-seeded pair. Um, so yeah, just uh, whoever's organising Radley's and old Bruce pairings might need to bump them up from number five pair to to number two or even number one. There you go. Well, I had, I definitely had Bailey. Um, although he is, I suppose, a top player, you just never want to play him. I practice with him frequently, and he is. He needs to enter more singles tournaments. He's a he's very good. Um, but, but I always, talk about lefties, I always used to lose to Alex Rosio Pamplin. He's, oh. he's tricky. His serve is tricky. Um, Sip, I'm not sure you come across him, but lefty hits... hits I think the brother, maybe. Forehand, forehand serve from the left. Uh, sorry, yeah. you, you know, rather than a backhand. And, uh, yeah, tricky, tricky little, little player there. Um, but stateside, Sip, we no longer class you as this because you're, you're, you've also, as you... Very, very well put. You won plenty of opens, um, so you can't count. But someone like John Kroll or Medlow or Barney—I mean, these guys. If you, when you get the U.S. Open draw, if you you, you just want to you want to stay clear of, of some of those. Um, yeah. So I think there's some, Chuck some dark horses well. for me. Sorry, yeah, I, I would Steve say Goat. those are those are pretty good ones. Yeah. Oh, Steve the, Goat, the yeah. US. For sure. Going is good one. Be, yeah. A, yeah. A few years ago, I would have said Tim Chisholm um, prior to his knee issues. I think he actually beat Neil like in the U.S. Open, maybe like in 2016 or something like that at the RNT. I want to. I'm, I'm like I'm pretty sure that was 
That was one. Um, yeah, Kroll, Barney. I would even class like Zach and 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 that group. And then from the UK, I had texted Tom. I would say either of the Bomford brothers, I would not be too keen on facing in the in the first round of a tournament. I would not be too keen on facing either of uh, Rory or Jamie Giddens. I mean, those are like, you know, they're sort of in the 12 to 20 ranking range um, and they can play quite well. So actually, yeah. while we're on this, I've, I've just thought of someone else who said you've beaten, but he's severely underrated, which is Graham Tyndall. Tyndall, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You had an epic match with him in, in Detroit. Yeah, I think I had, like, a very easy first game. And then the second game, like, got up, I want to say, like, 12 or 13-3. And then he got it back to, like, 13-12. And I was about to, yeah. you, know, you know what, in my pants. And then I think, like, he made a stupid error. And, like, I st- served one off the frame for, a, like, an ace or something like that and managed to to sneak it out. Um, but, yeah, that was, uh, that was a little scary. And then I had the pleasure of getting to play James Stout in the next round, which was great. Little some Cheltenham back to back action. I think some of yeah. these players are pretty underrated because they don't play them. Um, yeah, like Rock. If, if like, when was the last Rock. time Rock I played a tournament? Played against Rock recently, he's taken me to 10, 11. Like, I, I wouldn't want to be playing him in a tournament, especially if, if you look on ranking, he's sort of 200. So if people were sort of interested in the Neptune ranking, he'd be the last person you'd want to play. Just drop a bandit there. Yeah, that's oh. a big, that's a big bandito. I think I saw, yeah, Ryan Tully. I think uh, he showed up to the U.S. Open a few a few years back and beat beat Neil as well. All right, we better we better answer this question from Heidi. Yeah, Heidi just gave a secret question to the chat. Um, we wanted to know how much how many stone you put on in your uh, in your Chicago Fellowship year. Well, this is a this is a big question because I know Heidi knew where the. Uh, where the cookie jar was kept in the kitchen. Um, I also knew where the cookie jar was kept. I also, there was a story of me eating. I used to, I used to like the cheesecake in the fridge behind the cookie jar, which was also exactly. a bit, bit, bit dangerous. Um, but then again, I was running after a young Will Hopton who was um, training pretty hard at that time. So um, I, I, I definitely put on weight, but I don't think I'm in the top five category of, of Chicago weight gaming fellows. Um, but the food is truly ridiculously good. Um, I challenge anyone to go there and not put on weight. Um, Benny C, you must have, come on. Oh, I, I know exactly how much weight I put on. <laughs> I, Heidi, I heard the story of Heidi putting on some weight, so I made sure I weighed myself before I got there. And I was, <laughs> and I was kilograms i was 56 kilograms which is very light um but i came back at 66 and a half kilograms so that's a that's a proper effort and i i challenge yeah like almost 30 pounds 25 30 pounds about 25 pounds yeah that's impressive i mean you had the weight to gain no matter what but but that that certainly helped very skinny after being the fellow at queens i lost a lot of weight there just hitting balls all day um so i yeah but still and still a lot of successful weight gain story as far as the chefs at Chicago were concerned. Yeah, rightfully so. All right. I think we've got one more question and I think we're coming up on the hour mark, so we don't want to don't want to keep our listeners for too long. But what Tom, what would you say would be the best match you've ever seen, played, or have been a part of? The best match I've ever seen. Uh, not playing in was um, Coiny and Hoppy's first challenge in Chicago. Um, they played Cockcroft and ATB, who were, I think, the, the champions at the time. The gallery was ridiculous. Um, I was sitting in the crow's nest, like on top of the pipes, high up at the back of the court. Uh, I think I was with Stouty, and the noise was just absolutely incredible. You know, Chicago were fully fired up and it can get pretty loud in there. And I think it might have been, I don't know, April time. So it was it was warm, you know, and there was a lot of drink flowing and uh, it was it was loud. It was it was also an epic. I, can't remember, I think it was four two or something, but it was it was a ridiculously good game. Um, 
and having been there practicing with them the week before it was just a lot of fun to get involved in um and the best I match I've played um I, I think there's something about doubles in that you know you're sharing it, which makes it I don't know a little bit more memorable maybe I mean actually we lost this game but playing we lost to James and Jonathan 4-3 um, in the Open. I can't remember when it was, 2016 maybe. Um, and we just played really well. I mean, they, they came, I think we were 3-2 up and they, they they ended up winning. But but it was just such a fun game to push, even just by the scoreline, two unbelievable players who I look up to a lot. It was pretty, pretty cool to do that. Um, but Ben mentioned it earlier, the, the game against Snelly and, and Mole, there was some good rallies unfortunately that was on youtube which is means we can look back at some of those points um but yeah those those games stick out is pretty special um yeah how about you guys anything anything My, mine would just be any sort of cocktail match in chicago or most memorable i've played um this year i mean unfortunately i was playing with a left-handed partner who had cramps but still very fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, that was very entertaining. But my favourite one was two years before that with Ben Bonford um, winning the tournament, but specifically the Friday night, uh, Saturday night match against Coyne and Dunkley, which we, we didn't go in expecting to win. Um, and it was probably the best I'd played at the double score um, to that, at that point. Um, very loud gallery. People banging yeah. on different things. I was there. That was that was brilliant. That match. Yeah, you two didn't miss a ball. Didn't miss a ball. Heidi, I'm, I hope I know your answer, but <laughs> I hope it's the answer I'm, I'm expecting. I don't think it will be. I think one of my favourite matches to have seen, um, although I watched it online, was probably done as the game uh, uh, Hoppy. On most people thought he was down and out the first mm -hmm. leg. Um, so yeah, I think in recent times that's the one that that comes to my mind. What were you thinking of? Ben? Oh no, in terms of matches played, I was hoping you were going to say our one. Um, but yeah, I, I I think I was the only I was one of the about eight people in the gallery in the second leg for Hoppy and Duncliffe's Eliminator, um, which is such a shame because it was an extremely high level match. I mean. I know the school line was fall up Duncliffe, but um, and I was obviously Duncliffe's kind of hitting partner, and I never thought he was going to win any of those games. I think it was down in each game, and it was close. There were lots of rallies. I mean, the court suited done is a bit more. Uh, suddenly, you could retrieve a bit more. And, um, you know, unbelievable, unbelievable. That was that was a very exciting match to be on the other side of the pond for, with you sending me videos um, like every five minutes yeah. or so. <laughs> I was getting videos sent and like getting getting text message updates, and it was uh, it was nerve wracking to say the least because I was I would, I had been hitting with Hoppy a lot before he went over, so I was devastated for him. But um, that yeah, the, the videos of that match were very good quality. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was that was a good one. It was it was too bad for, that Hoppy had to lose, but uh, it was a, a heroic performance by Duncliffe. Sip, any memorable, memorable games for you? The best, all the best games I've ever witnessed are all in practice. I mean, they're like 2v1s or doubles matches with James and Jonathan. Um, some of the stuff that we've played, like I think you've been around for some of it when you come come and visit the r and I mean, no, it's, it's a shame that no one gets to see it. Um, we were texting earlier and we were talking about some of the best shots we've ever seen, like, yeah. When James was training up for, for his challenge with you, we would play two-on-one once or twice a week for the last sort of three months prior. And uh, just some of the stuff, when he was in the mood to actually do it, some of the stuff he would do is just like inhuman. I mean, he'd be doing like sprint from one side of the court, full sprint into the other left corner, full lunge, but the ball hit the crack in the floor. So he had to turn backwards and hit a forehand where he was already turned to hit a backhand and he hits a, like crazy stuff. Um, and Jonathan and I are like playing the best rackets we've ever played. 
I'd say yeah. in, like for me in terms of like actual tournament play, it would actually be a match that I lost to Jonathan fairly recently. We had a really good five game match at the USAM. Um, and then he went on to beat Christian three love. Um, he sort of turned the clock back for that tournament. It was really, really uh, an amazing performance by him. Cause I, I was pretty pleased with the way I played, but he, he really turned it up. Wow. Um, yeah. So that, that would be it. But um I think we're we're just about hitting the hour long mark, so I think we're going to call it. Tom, we really appreciate you coming out to doing this. Um, it's the first of hopefully several more uh, interviews with current and former world champions. So all of our our, uh, our viewers, look out for those. Next week we'll be doing uh, Willie Surtees on Tuesday, and hopefully be able to get that out um, very promptly. So look out for that. Um, next, I think we're also probably going to have one about the to finish the re the remainder of the courts um, sometime this weekend. Hopefully, if my children will take a nap on Sunday, uh, my wife will leave me alone. But you know, there, there's always hoping that happens, but never a guarantee. So um, look out for for our newest videos. Tom, thank you very much again. Say good good night, boys. Thanks so much for having me, chaps. Great to see you all. We really enjoy, enjoy keep this up because it's brilliant. Cheers. Great. All right, lads. See you soon.